This is Cashflow Ninja, episode 93 with Harry Dent. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Now, here is your host, MC Laubscher. Hello everyone, MC Lobster here and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a great show for you today and in today's show we're going to talk with Harry Dent about his outlook and forecasts for 2017. Harry Dent is a Harvard MBA, Fortune 100 consultant, new venture investor, noted speaker and best-selling author. And is also the founder and senior editor at Dent Research, where he dedicates himself to identifying and studying demographic, technological, and geopolitical trends. He has a free daily newsletter at harrydent.com called Economy and Markets. With his track record of accurately predicting Japan's collapse in 1989, the dot-com bubble bust in 2000, and the housing bust in 2006 and 2007, among many things, he has appeared on Good Morning America and PBS and is also a regular guest on CNBC and Fox Business. He's been featured in Barron's, Investors, Business Daily, Business Week, The Wall Street Journal, and American Demographics. And he's written numerous books, including The Great Boom Ahead in 1992, The Great Depression Ahead in 2008, The Great Crash Ahead in 2011, The Demographic Cliff in 2014, and The Sale of a Lifetime in 2016. Please share your feedback and thoughts with me on today's interview. You can let me know your thoughts on Twitter by tweeting me at MC Lobsher or by email at info at CashflowNinja.com. And please remember to join our mailing list by signing up at CashflowNinja.com or by texting CashflowNinja, one word, all capitalized, to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. As some of my listeners may know, I live in Newtown, Pennsylvania, a town that's about 45 minutes away from Philadelphia, the birthplace of the United States, the home of the cheesesteak, the Rocky Steps, and also the hometown of the beloved founding father, Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin believed that investment and knowledge pays the best interest, and early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. The Cashflow Ninja have aligned itself with partners that aims to empower you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Our healthy partner on it provides supplements, nutrient dense, and earth grown foods and fitness equipment to help you achieve your next level of well being and total human optimization. Our listeners can get a 10% discount with coupon code GET on it at cashflowninjahealth.com. Our wealthy partner Fundrise gives everyone the opportunity to invest directly in high quality real estate without the middleman. Fundrise makes the process of investing in the highest quality commercial real estate from around the country simple, efficient, and transparent. You can get started with as little as $1,000 and do not have to be an accredited investor to participate in some of their offerings. You can check them out at cashflowninjawealth.com. Dot com. And don't forget our wise partner, Audible. You can download any audio book for free when you try Audible for 30 days. You can grab your free audio book download at CashflowNinjaBook.com. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to the Cashflow Ninja Podcast with your host, MC Lobsher. You must be prepared to ignite. Mr. Dent, welcome back to the show. Yeah, nice to be back. What a year 2016 has been. Donald Trump, of course, winning the presidential race. And since Trump's election, we've seen a significant rally in the markets. The Trump train has taken off. What does a President Trump mean to the U.S. economy, markets, the average person in the United States? Are jobs coming back? Are happy days here again? Well, uh, yeah, people would like to think so. The markets think so. Uh, we do not see that. Uh, hardly all. He will make some difference, but not, he is not going to be able to create three to four percent sustainable growth. I can guarantee you that because it's demographically impossible. 
just as the Japanese have found since 1996 when they hit their demographic peak and their baby boomers started to slide downward in spending. They, they've had four times the stimulus we have cumulatively on their balance sheet and quantitative easing, and they're still on average growing near zero with zero productivity and near zero inflation most of the time. So you aging societies can't grow three to four percent. Younger societies like us in the early 1900s or the 1950s after World War II, yes, we can grow at rates like that. But you have to ask yourself, with population growth, I estimate now down to 0.27 percent over the next several decades, workforce growth at zero and negative for the next several years. Uh, unless we're going to have three to four percent productivity rates and we're at zero right now, uh, how are we going to create this miracle? And why would tax cuts encourage businesses to expand capacity in jobs if, if they've already taken all the free money given to them by the Fed and central banks at, at you know, zero inflation rates adjusted for, uh, I mean, zero interest rates adjusted for inflation, when mostly all they've done is buy back their own stock and engineer mergers and acquisitions, what they call financial engineering. So I don't see this happening. Reagan, pe people have to get, we have four seasons in our model of the economy. Reagan was walking out of the summer inflationary season coming in to a disinflationary fall boom. That means you have supply limitations. That's what inflation is. Supply is less than demand. So it made sense to cut taxes to expand supply. It made sense to cut regulations and all this sort of stuff. And, and, and it paid off. But we're coming into a period after a bubble boom, the greatest bubble in all history around the world, not just here, and in China, far more than here, where we have excess supply and demand is slowing from aging populations around the world and excessive debt burden. So I think this is the classical old Republican supply side. We're just going to lower taxes and double our growth rates. It's not going to happen. And in the next year, this is going to become obvious, probably sooner than later. And, and it's going to be the greatest disappointment created in history. They're, they're saying all the right things. The markets are buying it because they're desperate. Ain't going to happen. Mark my words on that. So even the infrastructure <laughs> spending that they were talking about, you don't see even that making a significant difference as well. That, that, that is the one intelligent thing. If you do it in projects that really mean something instead of just, you know, digging ditches and filling them back up, which is the classic Keynesian theory, because interest rates are so low long term, like they were in the Great Depression, it is a good time to build long term infrastructure. But such infrastructures take a long time to get approved and to get shovel ready. So this is not going to impact the economy in the next year or so. And I'm saying in the next year or so, this economy is not going to take off. It is going to slow further. Um, and then this whole bond rate, rate rise is going to reverse probably months from now. The next thing you're going to, we're going to know, we're going to be going into recession and everything from fiscal to monetary policy is going to be behind the eight ball, just like it was in 2008. So I, I don't think we make it through the summer and fall without falling back in recession. And all this talk of three to 4% growth is going to look like idiocy. And it is idiocy. It's not that these people are stupid. I just, you know, can't get uh, why politicians and economists, business people, everybody, nobody gets that the damn world is aging at the speed of light and Japan is leading the way. And Jan Japan is the perfect example, despite massive stimulus, on how little you can do to stimulate an aging society. Old people don't get sexier. They don't spend more money. They spend less. They pay down their debts. And they eventually die. And that means they don't ever buy houses again, as opposed to just keeping their house. I mean, demographics shows a lot of things that are predictably going to happen. And everybody's ignoring it. Like we can go back to the 1950s and the good old days or even the early 80s. It just There's nothing more predictable. But, but the entire country and world is in denial about this. Total denial. Now, the rate hike that the Fed just uh, brought about in 
in December, is that brought, do you think that's priced into the market already, or is that something that's going to have a, quite a significant impact when everybody comes back from their vacations uh, in the new year? No, I think that's largely priced in, and, and, and Yellen's hitting, you know, three rate hikes over the next year. Now, that totally depends on the economy. I don't think they'll have three rate hikes because I don't think the economy is going to hold up. Maybe they'll have one more maybe um, into the spring. I think they're going to be back to, to stopping the rate hikes and considering QE again. The problem is Japan and Europe now have found that after they've run quantitative easing for so many years, it's having less and less impact. And Europe and Japan went more negative rates. Negative rates actually work against the banks because depositors start, especially larger corporate depositors, start drawing money out rather than paying to keep it in. And, and they put it elsewhere, and the banks lose assets. That's one of the reasons that Treasury bond rates are going up. European banks are, are losing bank deposits for the first time after going negative QE, means it's backfiring. And they're not buying as many U.S. Treasury bonds, while China's dumping them to defend their currency, um, and so on. So all the trends are against. Demographics are against. Rates are rising. That's not good for the stock market and real estate. The dollar is rising, finally breaking out of a trading range for two years between 93 and 101. Next stop is 120. That puts the euro at 85 to 90. The dollar rising is like raising Fed funds rates globally because so many people, especially emerging countries, borrow money in dollars. When the dollar goes up, it costs more to initiate loans and it costs more to pay the interest and service them. So this is a tightening. So, so every trend is against the markets. And to me, it's just dumbfounding that after the markets first said, oh, my gosh, Brexit's a disaster because it's going to happen over the rest of Europe if it does, and then it passes, and they and they turn around and rally. Then they say Trump's a wrecking ball. You know, uh, who knows what the crazy guy's going to do and trade wars around the world, and then it rises after that, and then Italy votes no against Renzi, opening up for the more conservative party, which would favor uh, withdrawal from the euro, and the markets rally. The markets are on crack. They are crazy. And this is the final blow off rally. I think it could go another couple months, but I'm telling you, we're going to see the biggest opportunity for investors to make radical shifts away from risk assets in the next couple of months when this rally blows off and back in to safe um, bonds, treasuries and AAA corporates. The bond bubble, this is the first bond bubble. It is bursting. But there's another bond bubble to come when we go into deflation, like in the 1930s. We've had three stock bubbles. This is the third and last, and it's close to bursting. We've had two real estate bubbles, and that will probably be the last to burst, especially in China. But real estate's going to burst again. So all the risk ass assets have to reset after the greatest bubble in modern history and multiple bubbles. And the only place to go is cash the U.S. dollar, and high-quality sovereign bonds like the treasuries and AAA corporates. Somebody that makes that switch is going to preserve their capital and have money to buy into what I call in my new book, The Sale of a Lifetime, around 2020 to 2022. Everything's going to be on sale, 10, 20, 30, 40 cents on the dollar. Once in a lifetime, only the people with money are going to be able to take advantage of that. Everybody else is going to watch their assets fall dramatically yeah and let's stay on europe for a second because we've seen the the eu central bank just flood with quant unending quantitative easing basically uh, especially into their bond market and uh they wonder why they're destroying savings and why wealth and income equality is growing in europe and why you have all these very very angry people <laughs> voting for more populist movements what do you see is going on in the uh, the banks and more specifically the Italian banks? Because I I've watched that and I've I've figured that that might be something to light this powder keg, and uh, I've been keeping my eye on Deutsche Bank since our last uh, discussion as well. And <laughs> for what's going on there, I mean, speaking about the Walking Dead, uh, what what do you see going on in the Italian banks and what's happening with Deutsche Bank? Well, you know, uh, we were way ahead on this one. In, in our February newsletter, we came out and said, hey, look, 
Deutsche Bank is, is crashing. And, and a lot of the biggest banks in the world have been crashing. The Italian banks are crashing even faster, um, especially since 2015. Again, a second crash. How can the stock market be going up? And everybody thinks the economy okay when the largest banks in the world, and especially Deutsche Bank, the largest bank in Germany, they, they, they are in horrible shape. They've made bad loans around the world. They've got as much exposure to frackers in the U.S., as the big American banks do. They've got huge exposure to Italy. The central bank in Germany is owed almost $400 billion from Italy's central banks. It's like accounts receivable. They're not forcing them to pay. If Italy pulls out, they lose $400 billion right off the bat, not counting what the banks are going to lose on bad loans in Italy. Italy's got 18% non-performing loans in their banks. 10% says you're already technically bankrupt. Italy is bankrupt. It is the next Greece. It's too big to bail out or save. And, and, and this is going to come to head in the next months or year at the latest. And, and it's going to cause a, a showdown in Europe. Is, is Merkel going to finally turn around and bail out Deutsche Bank, even though she says she won't? She's going to have to. Italy's going to have to try to bail out their banks, but they don't have the wherewithal to do that. Are they going to allow bail-ins where, where the depositors have to get raped? To, to pay off the bank's debts and stuff. I mean, this is a real problem. And again, I can't believe the stock market is not um, more scared of this. I can't believe. Now, now think about this. Italian 10-year sovereign bonds are selling at lower rates than the U.S., and we're the best house in the entire world neighborhood, better than Germany, damn it, because we have decent demographics. They have horrible demographics. Germany has horrible exposure to Southern Europe. So, so this whole thing is crazy. It is the quantitative easing you were talking about. Uh, Mario Draghi will just keep buying sovereign bonds and mortgage bonds over there to push rates way lower than they should be. And, and so it causes people to speculate uh, instead of invest. Uh, and Mario Draghi's running out of bonds to buy. Japanese are running out of bonds to buy. Jap the Japan government central bank has bought 60% of the stock ETFs in addition to 40% of its massive bond market for sovereign bonds over there. This is crazy. You can't issue debt and then buy back your own debt with free money. If that's not the definition of cheating and something for nothing, I don't know what is. So, so to me, this, this only, there, there is no soft landing now. This has gone so far. In China, Japan, Europe, even the U.S., but we're still way better, that, that you're going to have to have a giant crisis for governments and people to wake up, and the people are going to say, enough of this. The populists are going to win. They're going to keep winning. They're going to say, we don't want to be a part of global trade in the world economy. We don't want central banks making the rich richer just to, and just to save the banks and give them low interest rates and high speculation while we basically get nothing, um, except that we can no longer save for retirement without buying junk bonds, which puts our retirement at risk. So this, this is a mess. And, and I, I think this is going to be viewed 5, 10, 15 years from now as the most irresponsible global banking policies in all of history. I mean, unbelievably irresponsible that you just you have a debt crisis instead of facing it and dealing with it. You just print money and cover it over. That that is that is disgusting from my point of view. From a demographic perspective, too, obviously there's the trend of the refugees still coming into Europe. Um, what impact do you see this trend having in the short term and in the long term? And how do you view this currently? Yeah, I mean, first of all, all developed countries are aging, especially Europe um, and, and East Asia, the fastest. We all need to be competing over the best immigrants in the world when we're not having enough kids to replace ourselves. The problem is the quality of immigration. I tell people in the United States, study Australia and Canada. They attract immigrants that on average have higher education and, and are easy to assimilate because they're largely Asian. Um, in the United States, we largely attract lower income and education immigrants who run across the border, uh, not formally accepted, not targeted. And even most of those, to me, contribute more to the economy than they don't. And, and they're not terribly hard to assimilate because they're Christian culture. When you look at these 
um, immigrants and migrants into Europe, these are people being forced. They're not choosing to come there for a better life. They're being forced out of their country, war-torn Civil War countries. They don't speak the language, not likely to anytime soon, and try to, I mean, talk about a hard-to-assimilate culture. And, and I think a lot of these people, they're there now, but, but they get a chance two, three, four years from now to go back to their countries when the Civil War is abate, and they will at some point. By my geopolitical cycle, they'll start abating about three years from now. A lot of them will go back. So, I, hey, if these were good immigrants, yeah, does Germany and Italy and all these countries need them? Yes, they do. But these are the worst immigrants, and they're only going to cost and already have cost a fortune to house in the meantime. So this is not a good solution for Europe short term. It could be long term if they could assimilate them. I don't think they will easily, and I don't think most of these people will stay. Right, and, and they're going into an environment, too, where the, the people in Europe are already competing for limited resources. Yeah, that's right. They're already, you know, in recession or near recession. Of course, southern Europe, Greece, Italy, these, these countries are in recession. I mean, Greece has still got super high unemployment, and all of southern Europe does. So, yeah, it's not like, yeah, yeah, they, they, they need people to fill jobs. There are no jobs. What is your current assessment of markets in Asia? Well, you know, they, they're getting a little more volatile. Uh, to me, uh, you know, Japan uh, went down 80 percent at worst from its peak in 39,000 in Nikkei. It's only rallied back up to 21,000 at best, like halfway, and it's been falling since then. I think you're going to see new lows in Japan in the next several years. But the big story over there is China. China's second bubble burst in, in mid to late 2015. 50%, 45% in the first three months, which is typical of most major bubbles we see in history. That's why I tell people to get out a little early, not a little late. Uh, nobody wants to miss those last games, but uh, that's fool's play to me. But China's been buying back and propping up their own market. So it's been going sideways now for several months. That's called a dead cat bounce. So it's not going back up. It's just treading sideways with heavy government support. That market's going down again. I think you're going to see the Shanghai at 1,000 before this is over. And I think it originally peaked at 6,000-something. So this is, uh, you know, Asia is going to go down as well. Japan uh, is struggling, even though its demographic trends have been mildly positive since uh, 2003. They turn strongly negative again from 2024. Japan uh, is going to get no relief from aging especially in the decades ahead. And China problem is first. It has started to age, and its workforce peaked in 2011. We'll drop off more in 2025. But the big problem in China, they have overbuilt their economy, industry, infrastructures, homes, condos, you name it, 10 to 15 years out. And now for the first time in 2015 last year, these rural migrants that have been pouring into the cities Actually, more of them went back home that came in. High pollution, super high real estate cost, and the biggest bubble in the world, high traffic, and these people are not registered citizens and are treated like illegal aliens, like illegal immigrants from Mexico would be treated here. They just said, to heck with it, I'm going back to the country, and I'm going to start like, you know, a little craft business or something. Now, looking at uh, 2017, we've spoken about this a uh, little bit of a continued rally, possibly into the spring and the summer, with then things maybe coming uh, or unwinding in Europe with the banks and a correction looming. What's your outlook for commodities like gold and silver and oil in 2017? Well, I tell you, we, we call gold and silver as good or better than anything. We The day of the top in silver... On April 25th, 2011, we said, okay, that's it. Silver was retesting its 1980 all-time bubble high. I say, man, if you're not going to sell here, sell gold and silver. Well, gold took another four months or something to peak a little higher. But we got people out there. We told people when gold broke its trading range of 1525 to 1800 on the downside, it was going to collapse. It did. When it got to 1,050 in late 2015, we said, okay, now gold is oversold and is due for a substantial bounce, but this is a bear market bounce. 
our target was as high as 1400 we went to 1378 we told people get out again if you haven't it's already down another 240 points gold is going to 700 bucks give or take in the next year or two ultimately it'll have to go to 400 to raise the bubble it went up like eight times in 10 years that's a bubble bigger than the stock market had and 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 then I'll buy gold, you know, three or four years from now when it, when it, when it's a race the bubble and it's somewhere between two fifty and four hundred. But gold is an inflation hedge. Whether you go back to the fifteen hundreds or you just go back the last hundred years or the last twenty years, there's one thing and only one thing that gold correlates with consistently: the inflation rate. We're going into a deflationary period. In fact, the reason we have such massive quantitative easing. It's all about fighting deflation, debt deleveraging, and bubble burst. That's all they're doing is trying to keep deflation at bay. When deflation sets in, gold's going to drop much further. The reason it dropped so suddenly and so strong in early 2013 was because that's when the Japanese went off the reservation and tripled their quantitative easing, and despite that, inflation rates kept falling that was the first time the book gold bugs finally got that that all this money printing is not going to create any substantial inflation it's just fighting deflation that's when gold lost its luster and it's not going to gain it back for a long time when it does uh another commodity cycle is due from the early 2020s into the late 2030s that could be the biggest gold run in history because that demographic surge will be dominated almost exclusively by emerging countries and especially by India, who's the next big thing. And India spends three times as much money uh, per their GDP on gold than China does. They spend as much as China does now. And, and when they're growing, they're going to dominate the demand for gold. And I, I think gold could go from 400 to 4,000 easily, but not now. I'm not touching gold. I'm telling people it's not the safe haven. The safe haven was already proven at the worst of the crisis in the second half of 2008 when Lehman Brothers went down. U.S. dollar went up, high quality treasury and sovereign bonds and cash. Those are the only three things that did well. Only three things going to do well in this next crash. And frankly, I don't give this next rally past the spring. I think it's probably going to peak by February or March, May at the latest. February, March, May. And what are you seeing for the real estate market? We've touched on that a little bit, too. Oh, it's becoming really unaffordable for the majority of folks, even with these low interest rates. Um, in our last conversation, we spoke about how frothy it is in all the major cities. What is your outlook for real estate? Yeah, you know, particularly in the bubble cities, the English-speaking coastal cities that are being bit up by, by you know, the, the, the Arabs, uh, Brazilians, uh, Chinese, um, foreign buyers. Those are the ones that are the most overvalued. Manhattan, San Francisco, London, Vancouver, Sydney, Australia, Singapore. These things are going to crash the most. I tell people real estate is much more varied than stock. Look at your real estate. The bubble really started between late 90s and early 2000. I picked January 2000 as the best single day look at your real estate whether it's an office building or a house or a vacation house what was it worth in january of 2000 that is your approximate downside risk most people are going to be shocked when they look at that unless you're in you know omaha or something you know that never bubbled up much even texas and colorado which didn't bubble that much the first time around it bubbled substantially you know colorado because of pot and, and texas because of fracking so so Real estate, the problem with real estate, it'll be the last to peak, typically, a little slower than stocks. But once it starts going down, it gets very illiquid. I, if I'm wrong about the stock market and have to get out a little late and it's down 20%, I can sell in a minute. Try selling real estate, especially in, in an expensive area when things turn the other way. There are no bids. Now, while we're waiting for the sale of a lifetime and keeping our powder dry... What industries and sectors uh, do you think will be desirable to invest in as far as uh, combining that with demographic trends uh, in the stock market, real estate markets, and other emerging trends? You mentioned marijuana 
In fact, I think marijuana won more states than Hillary Clinton did. <laughs> yeah, so, it's a little more interesting, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so um, what uh, markets and sectors are you looking at uh, that listeners can research while they're keeping the powder dry for the sale? Okay, well, number one, and, and I did this a long time ago. I look back at the Great Depression, the 1930s, and I said, you know what? Gambling, cigarettes, booze, you know, toilet paper, utilities, phones. There must have been some basic stuff that still did well. What happens when stocks crash is it's not just the earnings and the slowing of the economy. It's the compression of price-earnings ratios. All of a sudden, investors go from hunky-dory, la-la land, to seeing risk everywhere. So even if you're in a good sector like nursing homes, nursing homes is my number one sector for the future. They will never build enough of these. The baby boom wave is just hitting this in 2017. Will boom for 26 years or more. Um, healthcare, other aging sectors, cruise ships, but you don't want to be in stock of any of these until they've shaken out. That's what you buy when we see the next big bubble burst, like in the late 2019, early 2020. My best. And more so than that, emerging countries, especially India, when China fails. And people see how much they've overbuilt and how long it's going to take them to come back from that. India needs infrastructures. India is underinvested. India's demographics are growing like crazy. China's are already fading. India and the emerging world, especially Southeast Asia and South Asia, China's investing in Pakistan right now. Hey, we don't like their religious leanings, but Pakistan is like the next India after India if they get their act together. Those are going to be the places to invest. And remember, commodities have been the first of all the bubbles we predicted back years ago to burst the hardest. Commodities will probably, uh, and emerging countries will probably be the first to come out of this maybe around late 2019, early 2020. So emerging markets, commodities, including gold and silver, um, and the aging industries, in countries like the United States, that's going to be where you want to invest. You're going to have to invest more selectively because I've done a lot of analysis in recent months that show, hey, yeah, the emerging world is going to grow rapidly while the developed world continues to slow demographically, but it takes four or five emerging world customers or households to make up for one U.S. because we're five times as rich. So, so we're going to be in a slow growth world coming out of this, so you have to invest in the right places like India. Again, if I had to invest in one place coming out of the, the other side of this global crash in the next few years, India would be my number one choice. Very, very interesting. Uh, one last question for you. Staying on India, we've seen the war on cash accelerating ac- across the globe and especially accelerating in India with the two largest note, denominated notes being taken out of circulation. And that brings into di- uh, the conversation digital money. And also, if you look at other digital assets, we've seen quite a, a growth in the popularity of cryptocurrencies. Of course, blockchain technology is something that we're looking at could potentially ch- change our, the world that we live in. What do you see as far as the popularity and cryptocurrencies as an asset class to look at? And what's your general opinion of blockchain technologies? Well, you know, I I think blockchain technologies and Bitcoin, all that, I think it's the beginning of something. I mean, it's just as volatile as everything else right now. So how could it be a stable currency? But it's in its early stages and we are going to have to do something. I was just uh, did an interview with George Gilder, who speaks at our conferences and I mean, we both agree this floating exchange rates is the worst system ever designed ever. Why should a company be competitive one day in a country and then then the currency for some other monetary reasons or trade deficits or something all of a sudden, you know, devalues or or revalues and all of a sudden they're competitive or not? This is crazy. we got to come up with a better global monetary system. We don't have enough gold in the new world. The global world of high tech and healthcare and financial service stuff. There's not enough gold to back the currencies unless you got a microscope scope to read the slivers of it. So that there, there's got to be some new combination. It might be partially gold back. It certainly be some derivation uh, of this blockchain technology. I just don't think we've come up with that yet. And I think I think part of it will be when the monetary system does break down from excessive money printing and quantitative easing and 
financial asset bubbles collapsing and debt deleveraging. We're going to get reality real quickly about how, you know, how we have to retire at 75 instead of 65, we have to cut entitlements and spending. There's a lot of things we have to deal with. And then I think once, once we clear out all this funny money and bubbles, then it will be easier to build something for the future that is a more stable standard and money system. Money needs to matter again. It needs to measure something real. It can't be something that governments can manipulate at whim just to short-term stimulate their economy or to push their currency down to make their exports competitive suddenly, like Japan's been doing. And, I mean, Trump's complaining about China as a currency manipulator. They pegged their currency to the dollar. It's, it's only that it's been failing because their economy's slowing. And, and they, they've spent a trillion dollars in their foreign exchange reserves trying to prop up their yen on the yuan. They're just failing. But you shouldn't be able to do that. If a country manipulates its currency, then it ought to have international tariffs slapped on to compensate. They just should not be allowed to happen. And we got to come up with some better money medium globally and a way to settle trade imbalances without currencies going up and down like a yo-yo. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. I've always said, because I don't have China, in my retirement, if I ever do retire, I'm going to figure out a way to solve this stupid currency and balance of trade thing. It's just it's just ridiculous. Floating rates don't work. Oh, I definitely agree with you. Mr. Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show and discussing current trends and markets and the economy and demographic trends and uh, looking at some of your forecasts in 2017. Where can my listeners grab a copy of your book, A Sale of a Lifetime? You can get them at harrydent.com. I think we're offering just for four ninety five shipping, so the book's free. It will be available on Amazon again with my publisher starting in early January, but we have them now if you want to go to harrydent.com. Well, thank you so much for coming on, and have a happy, healthy, and prosperous uh, 2017. Okay, great talking with you again. Hi, this is MC Lobsher, the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast. As you may know, I'm also the president and chief wealth strategist of Valhalla Wealth Financial. We help individuals, families, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and professionals build their wealth outside of Wall Street and help investors maximize the use of every dollar in their personal economy and boost their investment gains. We do this by combining their capital and investments with the financial vehicle of the wealthy according to the infinite banking concept. If you are interested in learning more, you can email me at info at cashflowninja.com and I will send you a copy of Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. Thank you for joining my guest, Harry Dent, and myself on the Cashflow Ninja podcast today. If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here at the Cashflow Ninja, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes and share our show with family, friends, and your network. I've really been humbled by your support and feedback, and if there's any way that I can provide more value to you and serve you better, please reach out to me at info at cashflowninja.com. Don't forget to take advantage of the offers from our partners that aims to empower you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Our healthy partner on it provides supplements, nutrient dense, and earth-grown foods and fitness equipment to help you achieve your next level of well-being and total human optimization. Our listeners can get a 10% discount with coupon code get on it at cashflowninjahealth.com our wealthy partner fundrise gives everyone the opportunity to invest directly in high quality real estate without the middleman fundrise makes the process of investing in the highest quality commercial real estate from around the country simple efficient and transparent you can get started with as little as a thousand dollars and do not have to be an accredited investor to participate in some of their offerings you can check them out at cashflow ninja wealth Dot com. And don't forget our wise partner, Audible. You can download any audiobook for free when you try Audible for 30 days. You can grab your free audiobook download at CashflowNinjaBook.com. That's our show for today, everyone. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. You have been listening to the Cashflow Ninja with your host, MC Laubscher, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. 
Today's show notes and resources are available on our website, CashflowNinja.com. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objective, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.